Hello and greetings everyone. Welcome to another Educator Innovator Hangout on Air. It's Wednesday, March 4th, 2015. And we're here to kick off the second in a two-part series about an open portfolio project convened by Maker Education in collaboration with Indiana University's Creativity Lab. Today, we'll be highlighting examples of youth portfolios and portfolio experiences from the field. We're really excited to have this great group of guests to share what they're doing at their sites. Um, and we'll be discussing how a diverse range of maker spaces connect making and documentation, um, and then the implications for that work. So we have a packed show, but really excited. I'm your host, I'm Christina Cantrell from the National Writing Project, logging in from stormy Philadelphia, you can see behind me. Um, I'm excited to welcome our guests who bring a real range of background and experience in designing and using open portfolios with makers. I'll let everybody introduce themselves, starting on my screen to the left. So, Anna, you kick us off, please. Okay. Thanks, Christina. My name is Anna. I'm a second year doctorate student um, in Dr. Kylie Pepler's Creativity Labs. Um, I've been on the Open Portfolio project um, ever since it started, I think. And it's been really great and such a great learning experience. And I'm really happy to be with you again today um, talking about portfolios. Thank you. Great, thanks. And yes, um, the prompt should be your name, where you're connected to, and your connection to this project. That would be great. So thank you for modeling that, uh, Anna. Okay, uh, Beth, maybe you could go next. Um, if, unmute yourself. Um, hi, I'm Beth Costa. I am uh, the assistant principal at Monticello High School in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, we actually had the pleasure of having Stephanie uh, from Maker Ed spend two days studying our portfolio process, so that's my connection to this project. Um, we are in our second year of um, working with digital portfolios in the ninth, with ninth and tenth grade students. Great, thanks for being here. Okay, Jonathan, you're up. Hello, I'm Jonathan Prosey. I'm the program coordinator at the Digital Harbor Foundation in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we're a youth maker space, hacker space. Um, I'm the, I primarily work with our middle and high school groups. And last summer we had Stephanie and Anna visit our site and work with our youth, talk to them about portfolios, documenting, um, and the whole process. So I'm very excited to be representing Digital Harbor Foundation and sharing some of our findings. Great, thank you. Kylie? Hi, I'm Dr. Kylie Pepler. I'm here at Indiana University and I run the, um, the IU Creativity Labs. And so we've been studying sort of the integration of arts and new technologies, particularly in maker culture. And so my connection to this project is I am uh, one of the, the co-leads of the project and uh, you know it's been really fun to kind of conceptualize what it might mean to kind of really think about how we can take the power of maker culture and think about um, the assessment outcomes, thinking about kind of networking across projects and following that work over a lifetime to build this portfolio of work um, for kids as they enter college and into the workforce. Cool, thanks. And Brian, you're next. Hi there, my name is Brian Wolovich. I'm the president of the Millvale Community Library. And I would say we would be the babies of the open portfolio bunch. Uh, for anybody out there who's just trying to get started um, and learn what it's all about and not afraid to sort of model good practices of stepping into the unknown and getting messy and making mistakes and learning from them. Uh, we're we're uh, here to just talk about our experience. We are able to connect last summer um, with the Maker Ed initiative and as, uh, as a host site for Maker Core members and um, we're happy to host Anna for a visit uh, and just really excited to share our work and to connect with the rest of the group today. Great, thank you. I love when I can see stuff in the background too. <laughs> Okay, Stephanie, your turn. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Chang. Um, I'm the director of programs here at Maker Education Initiative. We are a nonprofit based in Oakland, and we're, a host, uh, we're hosting and leading um, the Open Portfolio Project with Dr. Kylie Pepler out of Indiana University. 
Um, we're just really excited again to be talking with all of you. I had the pleasure of visiting and or talking to a lot of our field sites this past summer and fall and it was really wonderful just to hear about what everyone is up to, what we're all finding and learning together and we're excited to share that today. Yay, great. And um, I should say I was also um, a participant in the National Working Group connected to the Open Portfolio Project. So. Um, so I'm just really thrilled we could do this because I was very excited about that work and what was surfacing. So um, Kylie, I want to start with you if we can. Um, we're super excited you can join us today, and um, as one of and you know this is part two, but I think for people just tuning in, it would be great if they could get some background on this project and um, maybe you could introduce them to it. Um, and some of the, the where they can find some more information about it too. Right, that's great. Um, well, welcome everybody. And you know, if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, you know, it's going to be an exciting week. And uh, you feel free to kind of continue to be in touch with us on the MakerEd all one word dot org site is a is a place that you can kind of find out more information about the OPP project. And so go to uh, MakerEd backslash OPP backslash about dash OPP and, and you'll get there. Or just Google it once you're in the MakerEd um, initiative site. So, you know, the Open Portfolio Project, you know, that's, those are all three really, really important kind of terms. Um, the, the openness uh, kind of signals that we're interested in thinking about portfolios as they're connected across sites. And so this is really important for our learners. Um, you know, I'm hearing increasingly from teachers, especially in schools, that they start these portfolios for youth um, because of these um, uh, Child Online Protection Act. Um, they're not even able to share their child's own work with the child as they're developing it until they they turn 13. Um, all sorts of other issues for uh, migrant children that actually move between schools frequently, that their work gets stranded at these sites, um, also stranded in their after school centers. So we started conceptualizing and sort of musing with Dale Doherty a while back, like what might it mean to be able to kind of keep all of your work at a central location over time? Don't we owe this to our, our children today? And this is an important issue for all educational contexts, and you're going to hear from a range of folks today, but um, it's particularly important for makers because they're, they're building and constructing things, and those artifacts have value and power in the world. And so as we start to start to pull them together, um, they start to even have even more power. Think about when you, when you go to um, interview interview somebody for a new position, you look at their portfolio, whether that's flattened into a CV, um, to their writings, or you look at, um, you know, graphic artists and what they produce, you're looking at the full body of work. If you're running an institution or your classroom, a lot of times to showcase uh, to parents or other um, uh, foundations that might be interested in investing in you, there's a, a notion that you have to share the, the classroom work that's there and how powerful it is not to have a set of worksheets, but really a set of projects that start to speak about the learning objectives, the deep engagement that children have. And isn't it even more powerful when they don't all look the same? That, you know, I've had parents sit and cry because, um, you know, for the first time that they're confronted with a portfolio that their child made and it looked like their child it looked it reflected what they know about their children um, when so often they're reduced to a test score number or to a set of worksheets that are graded on a 0 to 100 scale so as we start to think about broadening this conception of what it might mean and documenting this work over time it starts to have increasing power it also becomes this powerful way for us to think about and reflect on our own learning um, as well as our institutional learning. You know, how does your practice as a teacher um, or as an educator, out of school educator, actually change and shift over time? Um, so, so by having that documentation, we're able to ask some of those really complex questions. Um, so we see this as a national imperative um, right now, particularly at this moment when uh, standardized tests are having such value. Um, so this is a little bit of an incubator project. We're, we're we're trying to learn from the best of the best, and, and you're, you're going to see some of these sites that are doing really compelling things today, um, and, and to reflect on that over time. Um, and so there's been sort of a core group of us that have been involved um, across uh, Maker Education Initiative and the IU Creativity Labs. Um, and so, and Stephanie and uh, Anna have been kind of our, our, uh, our voices in the field. So they've actually been there uh, observing and uh, documenting what's happening, uh, taking extensive field notes and bringing that back. 
we're really excited. We're just ramping down phase one, and so we have a whole bunch of stuff to share with you. Um, so there's a, a whole report that, that Anna, uh, uh, Anna and Stephanie can point you to. But it summarizes the broader survey, so what people are doing. It summarizes some of our observations from uh, 10 different sites across the country. And, um, and it also kind of tells you a little bit more about the project. Um, Stephanie, do you want to tell people where that's hosted currently? Absolutely. So if you go to makered.org and under the Open Portfolio Project pages, there is a section specifically on research briefs. Um, we have nine to be released, and we've released seven of them already, and they're available there for anyone to read and download via PDF. Um, and as Kylie mentioned, they represent a whole series of findings and analysis um, from our survey, from our original um, dive into a literature review, as well as our field site visits and observations, and really hope to highlight and reflect on what we've learned and seen in the field. Um, and also, moving forward, what we hope to um, um, capture in our work continuing on open portfolios for sure. I just wanted to add, and Christina alluded to it briefly as well, is that we've been actually um, pulling together a national group of educators and uh, research uh, researchers and designers on um, a near monthly basis, as well as some more extended retreats um, uh, at the Moore Foundation, and we hosted one here at Indiana University. And we've really been thinking and musing about what those key problems are, how do we solve those as we move forward, and, and really drilling down, particularly around this work um, that we're doing with our hands and, and the difficulties around uh, documenting that that we'll get into today. So um, without further ado, I'd love to kind of turn it back over to Christina and, and uh, have you help us uh, kick off the program. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Kylie. Yeah, it's been really fascinating. This idea of documentation I'm really excited to get into today, too, because it's both the making and then the documentation of the making. And um, I think we're going to hear quite a bit about that from um, of folks here. I'm wondering um, if um, from the last um, webinar we had this um, question that came up. You know, um, Jessica and Hillary from Dreamyard and uh, Dreamyard um, and Parsons collaboration in New York were sharing about um, uh, some of the ways they're challenging traditional ideas of portfolios in working on their portfolios as they go and. Um, I think that Kylie, you did a nice job of starting to talk about, you know, sort of the openness of this, these portfolios and the power of that um, in this work. And maybe we can keep this idea of like, what is it that we are challenging as we um, work on these portfolios? What are some of the new questions and spaces that they bring up when we think about uh, maker portfolios and making them open and thinking about the possibilities that we have today that we might not have had um, before when we were developing portfolios? And also, what are some of the practices that we bring forward um, from some of the things that we've learned historically about portfolios, too? So maybe we can keep that all in mind when we start to um, look at portfolios across um, these three different sites. Um, so uh, I think that. Um, is there anything else the team wants to say before we kick off to, I think Jonathan was going to share first. Um, good? Okay. Great. So um, we're here today to hear from um, folks in the field who are really developing youth portfolios. And Jonathan, do you want to start us off here? Sure. Sure, absolutely. So we've been actively encouraging our youth to document portfolio since very much last, well, always, but very much since our program, um, our Maker Foundations program last spring. Um, so Maker Foundations, just to give an overview of what that is, it's um, the it's our introductory semester to to our center. So everybody comes in, they go through an interview, and this is for sixth grade through tenth grade are the ages that are accepted into Maker Foundations, and they go through an interview process, and then once they're selected, they enter into Maker Foundations, which is a roughly 12-week um, semester-long cycle where they get exposed to all of the different areas that we do. So they'll do some 3D design, 3D printing, um, graphic design, web development, game design, game development, basically just like a two-week overview of everything that we do. And a crucial part of that is 
adding in, it's not just instruction, they do, um, there's projects that are associated with every single module that they have to do. So they go through our instruction, and it's it's not direct instruction like a classroom, it's um, through our web page, they do, they go through the web content and follow along, work at their own pace, but then they have to also supply a mini project from a prompt that we give them. And a big part of that is, it's the project is half of it, but the documentation piece is the other half of it. So that's actually built right into our introductory program. Because the idea is after they finish Maker Foundations, they do a larger showcase piece. And then if everything goes, goes well with that and they're interested, then they can become members of our tech center, which um, they, that's when they have access to more advanced skills or workshops or more advanced training, a um, little less attendance requirement type thing. So it's a little bit less structured, but um, similar type commitment. We want them to be doing projects and we want them documenting what they're doing. So we want them to be both creative and productive. And the documentation piece is really crucial for us to be able to see, well, how productive are they being? Are they producing content? Are they sharing their ideas with the with their community? Whether it's like their actual community in our space or the larger community as a whole. So it's very much built into what we do in our in our in our program here. So we've been refining it every semester. The Maker Foundation semester runs in the fall and then in the spring. And even from the fall, the, we just started our spring semester in February. So even we've made changes from February or from the fall semester to the spring semester as far as documentation. So we're constantly trying to refine the process and see what what works best for us because we really just want that to be something that our youth know is built into the making process. We just from the very beginning we want them connecting those two that they're not like, necessarily independent. It's not making and then documenting. It's a whole. So with that, we've encouraged them to use um, TAC. TAC.com is big of what, for what we use for that. We actually build in instruction in TAC into our orientation piece. So the very onset of Maker Foundations, we have three days of orientation. And that is a little bit more direct instruction than the rest of the program. But that's where we really encourage them to use TAC, make TAC accounts, share it out, follow each other, follow everybody in the group follow our staff. Um, that's a new thing that we did this current spring semester is really encouraging the youth to follow staff and for our programming staff to have example tasks that they've all made and so that the kids and youth can see, well, this is something that our, our mentors or our, our, our coaches are doing as well and they also have that to model theirs after so we found that that's been even even though we're only a month in the spring semester that having the, the staff modeled portfolios is super helpful to get the youth more engaged because in the fall we had we had really solid output from from the from their portfolios one of the examples that I'm going to share is from this past fall um, but we we had a lot of it was a lot of us prompting them to follow each other and instead now from the very beginning of this semester they started following each other right away commenting on each other's portfolios right away and I think that us sharing out staff portfolios and showing that we do that we comment on each other's portfolios we comment on each other's tax streams showing that from the very beginning then kind of led them to like organically following each other instead of us telling them okay as this exercise follow all of your peers so that's one thing that we've noticed and taken away from it is that that's really from the very beginning you want to or we we found we wanted to start encouraging it um, instead of trying to fight it <laughs> the whole time through it's like no you need to go back and do this you need to go back and yeah um, but TAC has been an excellent entree into that because it's super straightforward and it's it allows them to have fun with it they enjoy that they can customize it to their own to their own liking. We have guiding questions that we encourage for each mini project. Uh, they follow a series of prompts kind of outlining their process for each project. But beyond that, they're able to put the pictures that they want. They can drop the pictures in directly. Um, there's option for video on TAC. And the video piece is a little bit trickier because you can't upload a video directly into the TAC page. So we run into the need for them to have like a YouTube account or something like that. And since we work with a lot of youth under 13, that gets to be a little bit of a trickier part. But for the pictures in the process, we've found that that's what we try to emphasize anyway. So it works out 
really well. That's great, Jonathan. I was saying I was, could send out a link if you want to share one of these so that people can do it on their own time, or do you want to share your screen? Absolutely. I can do either one, whichever. I have I have one example that is, or I have two examples that I included in the doc, and the first is from Sierra, who is one of our, our members from the very beginning, and she was kind of the the first of our members that we really encouraged to do attack to test it out. So hers was always kind of the model that we went to and modeled the youth portfolios after. And then the other attack that I've included is Thomas's, you, uh, and he was. Maybe. Oops. I mean, yeah, of course, I can pull it up and share the screen. Okay. Oops. Okay, let me share my screen. And Stephanie, I know um, uh, you know we've written a lot about um, Digital Harbor quite a bit. So, so maybe um, you want to share a little bit about some of the reflections and underscore some of the stuff that he's he's been sharing with us because there's lots of richness here. Absolutely, yeah. A lot of what Jonathan just talked through. There's some really nice salient points in there that you may have heard and may have may have missed. But I think some of the things that we've seen in a lot of Digital Harbor's work, which is just phenomenal, is what Jonathan is mentioning now, that they're um, orientating towards staff modeling, which I think we've seen at other sites before as well. It connects back to both um, Hillary Colos and Jessica's walk Jessica Walker's work back at the DreamGuard Parsons collaboration. Um, what Jonathan mentions about creating an experience or designing a youth experience that integrates both documentation and making with the same importance and expectation has been, I think, really important in terms of practice. And then I think what's neat, and Jonathan, maybe you can speak to this a little bit more, is the actual mm -hmm. tool that you're, they're using right now at Digital Harbor, which is TAC, T-A-C-K-K. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you guys stumbled upon this kind of accidentally after trying many other different platforms as well. And I mm -hmm. think there's just the things that you've mentioned, everything from being able to customize what you see, mm -hmm. um, the multimedia integration, even if video isn't perfect just yet. Um, being able to log in and kind of create your own, and I think you're about to jump into like the multiple projects that can be presented as part of one mm -hmm. account and page as well. Absolutely. So the like I said, in orientation, we have the youth log in. We provide email addresses for them as part of our program, so they have a youth email address, and then we have them make a TAC on their first day, so they make a TAC account, and we've even refined that further this semester by having them kind of make like an about me type page for their TAC, but Thomas's is from the fall, so he doesn't have an about page on his TAC, but you can see his his TACs here followed the progression of each of our modules. So he had a graphic design mini project, and he followed along with the prompts that I actually provided in an example TAC that I made. Just simple questions that they can just copy over and fill in the blanks, really, and just talk about their process. So. These questions I provided on my TAC, and I also put it in their, in their curriculum that they access. But we really encourage them to have a picture of it, but highlight the process that they're doing. Because really, we want it to be, if, somebody, if one of their peers sees their TAC and they want to be able to make like this logo or make whatever, that the process would be kind of replicated. And he has these for each of the projects. So... He, this is a project that he did with the Makey Makey during an introduction to electronics, and you see it follows the same kind of prompted responses, and he's able to just, they're able to just type that right into a TAC entry. And then as the semester progressed, his TACs got more detailed, which is what we, what we want. So he's still following the, the challenge, the, the prompt, but then he's also adding in more pictures to kind of go and follow along with that. And then he actually added a second TAC entry because he redid that project and kind of revamped it and fixed some of the problems that he had. And this is exactly what we were looking for for them to be doing in the fall. And that's where I'm going to switch to my TAC very quickly just to show um, the project prompt that I shared with them. Or not the project prompt, sorry, the, the guidelines. And this is just a very simple, straightforward guideline that I've shared and they can access this. They, I follow all of our youth, all of our programming staff follows the youth on TAC so that they can easily access our portfolios and our entries. Then I found that that really has helped them to to get the into the habit of just, this is something I can do. It's as easy as creating a TAC and entering it. 
and that's really worked out very well for for what we've done. And this time through, we've we've encouraged them from the very beginning, like I said, to make an about me page um, for their tack entry, just so we have a reference of who it is, getting them into the habit of doing it, and then just really from the very beginning, encouraging them for whatever projects they make. Um, Yes, it's good to follow the project prompts that I put up there, or the I'm sorry, the the documentation prompts that I put up there, but also that they should focus on their process of design and talking about what their process is and keeping it as connected with their project as possible. Um, I'm just going to switch over to another TAC entry. This is John John Carlos's. He is a, one of our programming staff, and he actually did. Um, the content for our Inkscape lesson, and he did the exact same thing that we wanted our youth to do. He talked about his process of he put his, he put his picture of his project on there, and he talked about his process for creating his character. And then we see we have some comment streams to really try to encourage them to be doing that this time round. And we see we we have them we follow all of our youth, and ideally we would have everybody following each other. But yeah, that's really the what we've we've just been trying to refine it each time through and I can also drop into our link um, our links I can put mine in there and some of our other staff tax as well just to see um, so you can see like how how we structured that but that's, that's the, it, yeah, sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's and then Sierra is just this is Sierra as the model tack that we kind of had and we show this as an example to our youth coming in as an introduction to the TAC because she has the pictures. It's very full, uh, lots of different pictures. And then she has this, this was kind of like our first youth to really experiment with TAC. She added a video to it. And so we share that out as just an example beyond the staff of like, here's what one of your peers at the Tech Center has done with TAC. But it's been a phenomenal tool for us for documentation. It really fits into the process. and. The youth really enjoy it, too. They enjoy the customization of it and um, everything with that. Yeah. That's awesome, Jonathan. Thank you. It's really interesting to see the teacher and student examples next to each other, too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, I just, you can unshare now, and I was, I was going to just say, sorry to interrupt you, but that um, mm -hmm. we will be sharing the links out in the live chat and then publishing them with this archive. So please all right. share all the examples and that people can have a chance to view them. On the Absolutely. Road. So, great. Thank you. Um, so why don't we hear from the other two so that we can then talk across sort of all of the pieces that we're seeing in here. And uh, um, I think, Beth, you were going to share some of the work um, there at Monticello. Uh, awesome. Um, so I don't know where to start. Um, we, for about five years now, um, we've had a, a pretty dynamic space in our library media center um, that has gradually over time uh, morphed into several hacker spaces, maker spaces, uh, creative commons, learning commons. Uh, and so about two years ago, what happened is our um, division uh, offered us the opportunity to uh, go one-to-one -one with a, a student device. And so we tried to um, merge the two initiatives together where we have kids down in our library media center making and creating and uh, doing all of this work and then how do you capture it and, and make it uh, more meaningful? How do you help them to reflect on it, continue to refine it and work on it? Um, and so we wanted to start digital portfolios with every student. Um, and so we started that with you know, our ninth graders who are now 10th graders. Um, and I think we're, you know, I'm watching Jonathan's, um, you know, work with kids and I'm super excited because I think that's more of a state where we want to be. Um, but we're really kind of having some, um, you know, trouble getting a public school, uh, two grade levels, all teachers, standardized test pressures. And so we're trying to really, um, you know, innovate and, and get kids creating and making, all the while paying attention to standardized tests and um, curriculum maps and things like that. So I'm just super excited. And that's actually why I uh, wanted to, was so excited about joining the um, portfolio project because is what I was looking for. How do you really help kids to own it? How do you find a really good platform where they can be collaborative, continue to refine instead of having work go there and stay there and just re remain dormant? Um, and so 
I think when we next year have the opportunity to go school-wide with portfolios, I would love to continue to collaborate with this project and really think about how do we really elevate and accelerate our work around um, portfolios. That's sort of our next big question is we have you know, we have a, a cohort of teachers and students who are embracing this. We have a cohort of teachers who sort of are struggling with how do we make it work. And um, so, you know, we are in a really good position to say, okay, here are our next steps, and, um, and, and we really need to, you know, sort of embrace this next wave of open portfolios. Um, so, I, you know, with that in mind, I have a couple of examples. Um, we have you know, we have the best of the best that I would say, and then, you know, we have some, some students who, um, too, have yet to sort of think of this as a natural part of what they do. So how do you, they're, they're making, but how do you get them to get really comfortable with archiving and then going back to and revisiting their work over time when, you know, there's the next lesson or the next unit is coming down the bike and they're very busy. Um, so um, let's see. I have... Um, Okay, so here is a student, can you see, can you see that? So here is a student in um, biology who, this is sort of a good example of, you know, documenting the process as opposed to just putting in her final project, doing some reflection at the end. We use Google Sites, um, which Stephanie highlighted in her, uh, I think it was Research Brief 4, that it was good at the time to get us started, um, but as we're moving along and talking with kids, uh, there are some things that, that I think we could use some um, help from kids to figure out better ways to, to work with this. But this is a student in a biology class who um, took you know, some work through each step of the process, got really excited about highlighting, wasn't asked to do, you know, if you knew this student, she's not frequently asked to do work like this. You would typically see um, her in class doing lots of worksheets and test prep. So I think kids really enjoy um, the difference in this work. Um, and we're really excited to offer them the opportunities. It's not about our um, highest functioning kids. It's about getting all kids to engage in this work and, and break away from that standardized uh, test curriculum. Uh, stop sharing. I'm not really like, uh, let's see. It seems to be working well, so. Okay, good. Um, this is another, uh, you'll see. Oh, you stop sharing now. You... Sorry. So um, let me go back. I saw it for a brief second. <laughs> um, okay, so let me go back to there and then here. Okay. Yeah. So here is another student, uh, Ella Chin, who got like super excited about her work, and um, you know she has all of her classes, all of her courses, and you know she takes the time um, every couple of weeks to go back and make sure that she's putting work in, uh, reflecting on it, thinking about it. She wants people to know about her. She does have you know um, a lot of information about her, things she gets excited about. She uses it almost as a blog too. Um, about what she's learning in the class and um, what the teachers are, do, you know, doing with that, with them. So, you know, she again is an example of how kids get excited about it and they get really engaged in that idea of this is a reflection of me. This is what I'm doing. Um, Wow, that's great. You know, it really speaks to the utility of portfolios, not just as something, you know, that should be constrained in the area of the arts, but really something across the curriculum. So seeing all of the, the biology, the chemistry, you know, the AP English courses, all of that just kind of there under one umbrella, it just is so powerful. Yeah, I, I, we agree, and we are, um, you know, we're getting um, teachers really excited. I think it takes a little bit of time. You're trying to shift a culture away um, from, you know, and I don't think it comes natural to anybody, you know, yet, just to, it's almost, like, like I think Jonathan mentioned, it's not about stopping and putting things in, but using it along the way. And I think some teachers are there and, and others, you know, it'll take a little while, but I think we're all learning from each other and really just trying to figure it, figure it out. 
Yeah, I was going to say that this is even a learning opportunity. Like this opportunity of the portfolio project is an opportunity to learn from each other. Um, and I think it's really exciting even just to see the ways you documented. Like here, <laughs> you know, like very sort of straightforward. Like here's here's what I did, and then here's another thing I did. And, then... and I think too. I mean, if you you know just to understand our culture, I mean we. We have a very, very diverse, um, you know, population of students, and we have students who come from all different socioeconomic status, and, and you know, a lot of times these are the kids who would not be challenged in this way. Like they would not be given projects because maybe they have the, the teachers are more worried about them passing the, the our students' standards of learning. And so what we're really, the, the first thing that we celebrated was breaking out of that, this is for the kids who we know already will pass the test. This is for everybody. And I think that's what kids get excited about is that they are being challenged and asked to do that work when previously they may have not been. So important and, and such a key piece of all of this too, I, I believe. Um, thank you, Beth. Those are great examples. Um, to forward our discussion. Um, we're going to move to Brian now. Um, does anybody want to say anything before we move? Okay, we're going to come back and talk through because there's lots of richness coming up in all of these. But um, great. And Brian, do you want to? Yeah. Hi. Uh, just uh, happy to jump in here at this point. Uh, wow, there's, I've got a million things to say, actually. Um, Christina, but I'm going to not comment on there. Uh, all the great things happening at the other sites, and I'm going to stay focused right now because um, I know we've got a lot to cover. Uh, uh, here at the Millville Library is the site that we were able to connect with. Uh, some of the things that are unique about our space, uh, Millville is a small community located right on the edge of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we are two and a half miles from downtown Pittsburgh and right along the Allegheny River. Um, it's kind of a quintessential small working class community, uh, Mill Vale. Uh, you, the steel mills were kind of a big deal here. And um, in, in the history of that, you know, sort of carried in our community. Um, our project itself, the, the library itself, is sort of a, we think of it as a maker project. Uh, between 2007 and 2013, um, over a thousand volunteers came together and gave over 50,000 um, hours of volunteer service to actually create our library. Uh, it's the first library that our community has known in the in 100 and almost 50 year history. Um, so it was really a moving process and much like um, you know what we're talking about today and the making activities, um, you know it's as much about a social movement and, 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 and as a something that can create social change uh, as well as it, as it is about um, you know what we're actually creating so uh, that's one of the the key pieces to our story the other is um, you know that our library is focused on um, how do we honor you know the, the kids where they're at in the community and one of the th reasons we, we did not intend on having a maker space um, you know we we, we just weren't there yet organizationally, frankly. We do this all as volunteers. I'm actually a sixth grade teacher. I've been teaching for 12 years uh, at the Quaker Valley School District uh, here just outside of Pittsburgh. So this is what we do on weekends and evenings, and everybody has their own story. Um, but what's really awesome is the, the way it was set up is the properties we purchased, gutted, and renovated, there are actually three apartments on site that people live in and they pay rent to help keep us going and there's an office on site that people use again to help keep everything going um, so we're showing some of the sort of practical applications of of, of the work that's happening here um, and really a bottom triple bottom line approach um, and what was really lucky for us and fortunate for us is that in Pittsburgh we have a regional um, powerhouse in the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh uh, they have a program called the Make Shop and they very luckily I just happened to connect with um, uh, a wonderful woman there Lisa Brams and Lisa um, was in the process of putting together a program called the Mobile Make Shop and they were actually starting and seeding ideas and helping to design um, programming for spaces that were starting up like ours and we just uh, the right place in the right time and um, that was in 2013 throughout that school year last year we were able to connect in the summer um, with the Maker Core program and really at that point we I would say we weren't there yet uh, in looking beyond um, 
making as the process itself and really how to share and the importance of, of documentation. Um, you know, Jonathan was commenting on how it, it's really married. It, it, there's not one without the other and that's a lesson we've learned um, over, over our, our experience and um, something that's very valuable that I would certainly to anybody participating who you know is starting off like, like we were and are, um, something to really take to heart. Um, I would like to show, you know, through participating in the Open Portfolio Project, though, we were able to really get down and get some ideas and start to, to understand the value. And so thank you for, uh, for Dr. Kylie Pepler and for Anna and for Stephanie for connecting and pulling together all those resources to really help build, uh, you know, build our capacity um, and, and everything. So I wanted to share uh, two two pro two projects that we ended up working with uh, during this this past summer, and I think they're really um, indicative of where we are right now, and uh, not necessarily where we're trying to get to. But um, what you will see in both of the projects that I that I'm sending you is um, things that are indicative to our space. Number one, we are a drop-in space, so um, kids can show up or leave at any point. They've had enough of us. It's not like when I'm a teacher and they have to stay there and I've got them hostage. Um, so they, they can come and go as they please. The other piece is that um, some of our documentation is documentation of, of projects that are happening by groups. Um, and they maybe they somebody might tinker with a project and let set it down, and somebody might pick that up, and different people are working on it. So there's a little bit of a you know a challenge there, a difference really. How do we document group processes? So this is the first one that I'd like to share. Okay. Uh, essentially, this was made by our Maker Core member last summer, Nora Peters, and Nora um, had a chance to work with Anna and to um, really engage uh, through through learning about portfolio making. And we were really just focused on how can we document um, the the kids who are having fun; uh, they're engaged. One of my favorite projects that you'll see in the center here, um, this was a homemade foosball table that all these kids came together to create. And um, one of the young men actually brought in all a bunch of his action figures. And uh, kids were, they, they, took, they took their action figures and they became the players in the foosball table. And they just had a blast with it. And uh, they're so proud of pulling this together. But you know, our, we're trying to just focus on how do we get kids um, proud of their work, proud of themselves. Um, you know, celebrating skills that not um, you know they, they don't necessarily get an opportunity to pursue otherwise. So you know, we just really um, you know had a blast with with our first I'll say our foray into documentation. Um, this is one of my favorite ones on the side here where we took an old printer and, um, you know, took it apart and we did a take apart activity. And I know uh, last week Jessica Ross was on and um, her work with Agency by Design is fantastic and I've got a chance to, to um, learn more about that. And actually last summer we worked through um, this take apart activity using um, a thinking routine that's known as parts, purposes, and complexities, and it's just a really nice way to frame student thinking. And um, you know, within that is really, you know, how do you make their thinking visible? How do you how do you get that down? And really, that's what we're doing through um, portfolios. And you can just see some of the kids having fun. This I love was our we had a we created a bike shop, and kids would bring in their bicycles, learn how to fix them take them apart, learn different tools. Uh, every Tuesday, we had Bike Tuesdays. And so we're trying to make, again, make their work applicable to, to their lives. And this last piece that I wanted to show you um, is was a group effort. And I'm going to switch right now to, sorry. OK, so this piece, there was a photo. But and you can't really gain the full immensity of it. But this was, um, you know, they did a documentation piece of the summer at the library and all of their activities and everything they were working on. Um, and what's really great is, it, you know, they're celebrating their their talents. 
Um, they're getting together. They're writing in ways that are authentic and that they have a connection to and they're relevant to what's happening. So um, I'll just try to give you a, a glimpse of, of some of it. Um, my favorite one was, let's see, there is a, uh, right there, there was a foosball injury, and it's showing one of the heads fell off an action figure. <laughs> but um, just a lot of a lot of fun, again, just trying to document our, our processes. And the last piece that I just wanted to share was, um, before we, we move on, was, um, you know, we're trying to focus on an assets-based approach. We're trying to celebrate um, the kids where they're at, celebrate their strengths, and making as well as um, documenting making provides an opportunity for us to celebrate um, things that aren't always celebrated. And the other piece is, um, as a teacher, I'm starting to learn about this is like a petri dish, if you will, and we're able to get a little bit messy in ways that I'm not able to in the classroom. So there are things, there's lessons that are being carried over. Um, and I'm in a public school. We deal with the, the state standards and the assessments and all that fun stuff that um, you know we don't always get to get to uh, to play with for real, you know, in this way. And one of the great things was learning if I'm documenting my portfolios, you know, using portfolio thinking as a documentation tool, um, our standards and our measurement as a teacher and as, as our schools are moving towards actually a process um, assessment. We have something in our state called PVAS. It's um, essentially a measurement of how teachers are adding value to students' lives and their and students' learning. And it's it's really based off of you know how you're scoring on tests but you have to show and document where a student was and essentially where you got them to as a teacher and if there are other tools and other ways that we um, as educators can can work on showing where we were where we got to um, I think we can start to open up conversations around school reform assessment reform and, and legitimate uh, methodologies to get there so um, that's that's our, what's going on in Millvale. That's what's happening. So thank you. Awesome. And what a great, um, you know, way to um, help us open up a conversation. Um, and thank you all. Um, I can just see everybody's excitement in the background as they're noticing different things. And Brian, you were saying you had so many things you wanted to comment. Um, Jonathan, I want to. Um, you made a comment, um, so maybe you could kick us off here, and I'd really like just to open up the conversation for us to really talk about the things we notice and some of the themes we see carrying through that might tie to the larger uh, research project, too. But go for it, Jonathan. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really like the what you had mentioned about since you're a drop-in space, that you have the idea of like a, a project that it becomes a group project, but it's through like individuals kind of contributing to it as they're coming in, and it evolves into a group project. And I really love that idea because um, a lot of what we do, just because of the nature of how our program is set up, tends to be very individual projects um, with our youth. We really encourage them to share out their documentation and process with the group, but the projects themselves tend to be very individual. So that's a piece that we're really looking to expand on and think about like well how in our game development module can we make it so that it's more of like a group piece or bringing in a group piece or just different individual youth working on certain parts and then collaborating to bring it together um, so I really like that that's really that's cool and then you're using the documentation to kind of keep everything together I'm, I'm assuming so I, I love that that's great thank you Anna did you want to say something too I saw you Sure. I think seeing seeing the work that um, Brian presented now is really interesting because when we were visiting Millvale, we really started working on this poster, and it was really an emergent kind of portfolio practice that came out of our visit um, over the pat over the two days that we that we stayed here. And and what we learned really through this process was, especially in a, such a collaborative space as Millvale, that and I was working with Anna and Nora um, on really thinking about what this poster may look like or what even a website of the documentation of the summer work would look like, we started to think that it would be super important that everybody involved has equal access to all these photo repositories and like including the youth, the parents of the youth and so forth, that they can really start commenting on the pictures 
And also, not just commenting and typing, but if we had a tool that would allow the youth who cannot write just yet record audio messages or drawings about the pictures that they're seeing, because they really started to come up with these really funny um, quotations that really enriched the photos that we saw um, Brian share on the poster, but also on Nora's website. So I think these kind of things really started started to make us think of innovative tools or different ways of using existing tools, such as maybe um, Google Pictures of making um, animated GIFs of um, project processes and so forth. I feel like one of the things I'm starting to hear is really sort of like all the ways that there's different access points that are being opened up in different um, for all learners in these projects. And I think we saw that um, Beth spoke about that really clearly too. And Jonathan, we can see that across the uh, projects here. Are there other themes that we start to see across these projects? Um, I was starting to think about. Um, just even the way that um, kids are able to um, uh, celebrate themselves and their identity in these projects is another one I heard. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It also seems like um, I, I'm interested in kind of drawing out some of the distinctions about uh, working in and out of school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, was there was there something that you you saw in particular, Beth, as as you were kind of listening to these other examples? Yeah, um, I think again, it's that tension between the curriculum and uh, trying to meet the learner where he or she is, find the, the learner's interest. I mean, all of the you know Jonathan and Luke spoke about you know kids come, being able to come in and really drive their learning and, and pick apart something. You know, well, I'm interested in learning how a printer works, or I'm interested in fixing my bike, or um, and I think that that will we have some innovators um, in our buildings who really have that depth of knowledge to, to find those points. Like, they really are access points. I mean, what in this curriculum interests uh, me? Um, what, what do I want to take? How do I want to take my learning to a different level? Um, and it may not be, you know, it won't be the same for all kids, but it may, uh, it can't be teacher controlled either. Like, it has to be um, really learner driven. Um, and I think that that's something that um, we'll learn to think more about um, in year three. Uh, again, all the while, you know, sort of working within that tension of at the at the end, there are the same learning outcomes for kids, um, and so that's that. Those are tough things for teachers to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Beth, I think too, you spoke really beautifully about when in some of the examples that you showed that just the opportunity for your students to create a portfolio allows them to present a reflection of themselves that they might not be able to otherwise, and that just that opportunity already is giving them their own um, their own way to showcase what they're doing, their their voice, their abilities, their interests. I noticed one of them you had mentioned she's relatively quiet, but she's you know clearly excited about school and wants to show off what she's doing. So just that, I think, is a really important step. That's great, Stephanie. Thank you. So we have about um, five minutes left to the webinar, and I'm wondering if we could sort of like bring it back. And a question came up last time, you know, what is really, what is an open maker portfolio? And we've just seen these like really diverse examples, but I think we can see some salient threads that run through them. I think, Beth, you just spoke to one of them, this sort of learner-centered nature of them it seems to be a core piece of this. Are there other aspects of it that um, you would say, um, as, a, as a team working on this for the last few years, that you've seen sort of you know, just what, how would you start to describe what you're seeing in these portfolios as an open maker portfolio and an open portfolio? Yeah, we've, we've kind of seen a few different things that have been happening. Um, and so part of that has been uh, in maker portfolios, as I say, opposed to um, fine arts portfolios, a lot of times makers are right there with their work, right? It's not a staging of the work. It's not, it's not um, uh, you know, kind of highly edited. It, it's something, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's this holding of things. And it's, um, it's a lot of times that means it's in progress, right? And so it's just taking a snapshot of what's happening. Um, but as a result, it has a little bit of a, a different aesthetic quality to it. Um, and so it looks um, uh, more approachable, sort of more meaningful. 
I think the works that are kind of um, portrayed too really cross a lot of disciplinary boundaries. So in a way, you could think about them as an art form. In a way, you could think about them as being kind of a STEM product, you know, kind of a, an engineering or computer science product. Um, a lot of times, they, they have to like worry about kind of um, text, as you saw in a lot of these things, about code, and about sort of the physical making, and a lot of emphasis on process. Um, Stephanie, Anna, do you want to kind of draw some of the um, broader uh, conclusions that we've been seeing across the portfolios? Yeah, I think echoing what Kylie's saying there too is that we've seen that portfolios are allowing um, youth to really reflect parts of themselves and so that might showcase more of their aesthetic stance on things, it might showcase a little bit more that they're excited about un discovering and uncovering the functionality behind things. Um, the process I think is emphasized a little bit more um, and it's either even more important or just as equal to the, the product itself um, and that's a lot I've, in, in some of the other field sites that we visited as well. Some of the prompts that Jonathan mentions too are just as simple as what, where is your project at now compared to where it was last week and being able to write about that and speak about that in a way that is clear to others is also a learning process in and of itself. Um, and I'm also wondering if I could ask about tools because we just saw a huge range of of ways that you all documented your stuff, and both documented and then where you put your portfolios. So um, maybe, we, does anybody want to speak to that or what you noticed about that or some of the larger themes we know about that? Uh, Anna, you know, you're really, really poised to talk about this. Um, so it's been part of your, your research over time. But what's been fascinating is that um, documenting process and documenting um, this kind of like diversity and stuff is actually kind of challenging, both from a hardware and a software perspective. And so um, you can see across these projects, people are kind of making use of ready-made materials that are out there. Most of them haven't been really designed for makers. Um, one notable exception from that is what uh, Tiffany Sang has been doing um, at the MIT Media Lab, the Lifelong Kindergarten Group, and doing something on build in progress so that we can kind of visualize that process over time. Um, but but Anna's been looking at uh, all of these barriers, you know, just from, uh, you know, if you, the most common way to document is your phone or your iPad, but, but if just by nature, you know, it kind of ends up being put uh, you know, on the table in between things, and you kind of forget about it. It's like, oh wait, I just did a whole bunch of stuff. I was just in the flow. I got to document it again. And then there's this disappointment because you d you didn't you know kind of capture these middle steps and so forth. And so makers are doing some really cool and innovative kinds of things with Lego, and and we've we've got a whole research brief. Um, uh, just summarizing some of the things that we think are really interesting, how to kind of make a, a DIY stand out of an egg carton and a couple pencils, for example. Things that are really low cost and very makery to kind of help in the documentation process. And it's funny, just these small moves are starting to change it. So um, I know Paul O over there um, at Educator Innovator is, was talking about um, how just putting the iPad in one of these egg carton stands um, it started, it started to become a mirror, a reflection kind of thing. And so the kids were watching themselves making. And so it was a very different kind of experience um, than, than, say, looking at the pictures after the fact and then arranging a story. Um, so we're just starting to learn a little bit about the hardware and the software needs of the community. Um, but we are finding that you know, in terms of future development, this is a really hot area. Oh, I'm so sad we're close to the end here because it is a really, um, or we are at the end, it is a really uh, amazing range of content that is here and um, conversations that we could continue to have. So what I am hoping is that this is the beginning of, you know, these kinds of conversations that we will continue. And maybe, uh, Stephanie, you would want to talk about just sort of those um, uh, next steps and what you might ask for people and remind people maybe even where the research is so they can see it themselves. Absolutely, yeah, and I echo exactly what Christina has said, is that we hope that these sorts of conversations continue. If you're doing, if you're watching and you're doing portfolio, any sort of portfolio work, um, please join in and tell us what you're doing. We're happy to share. 
um, and learn from you as well. And again, if you're interested in some of the, um, the research briefs that have come out of the project and we're continuing to release them, they're located at makered.org slash OPP. Um, and feel free to contact me as well or Kylie or Anne or any of us um, to engage with us further. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, making the time to be here <laughs> and really, you know, sharing with us um, the great work that you're doing. I'm really excited to continue to learn with you um, here at, at innovator.org. Um, and for those who might be watching, I just want to say that um, if you join at innovator.org, that's one way to keep further abreast of opportunities to continue these kind of discussions. So um, please do that. We are also on Twitter at, at innovates underscore ed. And, um, and we uh, hope to see you sometime soon. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. And have a nice evening. Thank, thank you. you.